name is Polly Osborne. I'm the Vice President of the American Institute of Architects, Monterey Bay Chapter. Welcome to our third and final Arts and Architecture lecture for this series. In our first lecture, we looked at the global view with Leon Panetta. And in our second, we looked at the local perspective with advocates for the environment and local development advocates and um, uh, saw the problems. Surprisingly, they had a lot of agreement. Uh, <laughs> and now we get to look at the perspective of working directly with the land. I wanted to thank some of our chapter sponsors, especially Hayward Lumber, ARC, Granite Rock, and Carmel Stone Imports. And thank you, Cheesebro, for the delicious wine. Um, and I wanted to just give an overview of some of the things we've done this year because uh, it's been a crazy couple of years, as we all know. You never know whether to put this on or take it off. Um, besides the Arch 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 Architecture Series, we've had um, a wonderful house tour last year with Carmel Heritage, and there's another one uh, coming up in September, September 24th. The Committee on the Environment has done some excellent uh, green spec workshops. We've had uh, programs on accessory dwelling units, and we've worked um, on fire safety and recovery, and we've worked on advocacy for local environmental causes, historical preservations, and issues where design is of the utmost importance. And the Sandcastle Building Contest is coming up on September 17th, so get your shovels ready. I encourage everybody uh, to, um, you know, get on our mail list and see what we're doing because our programs are open to the public. Um, and if you're a member, I encourage you to get involved. And we'd love to hear from everybody things that we um, might do better or we did really well. And uh, so thank you for coming, stay in touch. And without further ado, our fearless leader of arts and architecture, Marianne Shekatens. Thank you, Polly. Thanks. Thank you. Well, I will make it really brief. Um, it is a great honor <laughs> for me to introduce my uh, friend and colleague, Bernard Trainer tonight. I, I greatly admire uh, Bernard's personal and professional journey coming here from another continent and looking at this California landscape with new eyes and his artful uh, interpretation of this landscape uh, led to him having one of the most renowned um, uh, landscape architecture companies in California. And this um, you know, artful interpretation making the California landscape, a beautiful garden, working with the California landscape really makes him a perfect candidate to speak today. What a good transition of the wilderness to the built environment can be like. And with that, please help me welcome Bernard Trainer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marianne. Um, Marianne is somebody I hugely respect. Uh, as a person and also for her work. So when she asked me to speak, I think I took about five seconds and said yes, and then the last two hours I've been dreading it. <laughs> it was one of those situations, what was I thinking? It's always a little nerve-wracking to speak, but also good to sort of for me to see the work gives you a chance to look back over the work because we've, as architects and um, interior designers and landscape architects know, we're always looking forward to the next garden and sometimes we're not looking back at our imagery. So it gave me a good chance to look at our work and sort of reflect on where we are as a firm. As Marianne said, I'm, I'm an imposter really. I arrived here from England and I grew up in Australia and have spent the last nearly 30 years trying to get a grip on how to work in this landscape. It really is not an easy task. It's, I'd say it's one of the more challenging places I've ever worked, um, and also one of the most, um, one of the best opportunities as well. But you know, we're obviously 
we struggle with resources, and so there's this beautiful landscape, um, but simultaneously um, trying to figure out how we can do livable gardens here is not an easy task. So yeah, there's a lot of people who came before us, and um, I've learned a lot, I think, arriving, particularly arriving in Monterey about um, 16 years ago, and walking around the adobes and the mission gardens, um, I'm always looking for clues as to how they survived, um, what were the little tricks that they used, what are the surviving plants, what are the building materials. Um, I, I trained in England for a while and I spent my whole time studying there, arguing with the um, professor about classic garden principles and I don't care about those, I just want to do modern gardens, let's get on with it, you know, was kind of my attitude. And then I've spent every minute in Monterey County or in California um, looking back and realizing there's so many clues and I think how did we lose our way uh, many times and there's just so many great, um, great um, clues looking in these old gardens. And, you know, thinking about what I said earlier, it's just, in many cases, it was just a case of survival. And you can see the situation here where people are just building with materials that they found on the site and trying to survive with families, as simple as that. Um, we also, um, in our work, we see a lot of evidence of what's come before us as far as plant material and evidence of... Um, uh, you know, what, who, you can see where the cattle and the livestock have been on sites. So all of these visual clues are really interesting to me of thinking, you know, what, how do we go about not necessarily undoing some of those things, but taking it forward in a thoughtful way where we're not going to replicate nature, essentially, but there's also really good clues on how we can interpret the past and then take it forward the best. And they're, they're things our office does constantly. And then, you know, speaking of the cultural history, that's how I see our firm. This is a photograph taken last year of a field trip that we did. And we're part of the cultural history as well. And we take that really seriously. Um, we have a wonderful team of people. Everybody, it's not me who does this work. It was probably 15 years ago I was by myself um, and since, I've just been collecting great people, making me look good, essentially. Um, and I have two co-owners, David Leroy on the left-hand end and Ben Langford on the right end there. And then just a wonderful group of people um, who are some seniors, some just arriving, all working together, collaborating on every landscape that we do. Context is the biggest part of our work, I would say. Like trying to think how we can interpret all these different landscapes that we deal with. I think before I came to California, Los Angeles was California. As far as a foreigner goes, when I thought of California, it was only Los Angeles. I didn't even know Northern California existed as a child. You know, you just went to Hollywood and that was California. And so I had no idea about the range of ecotypes that were here. And so this, this is something we study quite closely as far as all these different ecoregions. Um, we do most of our work, I would say, Central Coast and San Francisco Bay Area, but we also have a range of projects um, in Southern California and also up in Napa Valley region. We have a lot of projects as well. Um, but the thing that keeps us honest as a firm, every time we think we know something about a region, you go one valley over and, of course, you get the shock of your life. So as a landscape designer, you always have to be on your toes as far as not assuming anything and always studying um, the site very closely and doing a, a really thorough analysis. And then this shows the range of projects that we've worked on just in this region. Um, so you can see a lot in Carmel Valley, a lot around Monterey Bay, and then a few down in Big Sur, and then some further north in Santa Cruz as well. And then, um, so there's a splattering of projects, the high concentration, and then one outlier to the east there in Cienega Valley, which I'll show you in a minute. And then we also work on the coast. They're some of our, our favorite projects. I'll be showing you some of the inland projects and some of the coastal projects. Beautiful Santa Lucia Preserve. 
I didn't know Santa Lucia Preserve um, existed until I arrived here. And somebody uh, called about a project and just one of the most amazing places in the world, I think, to work as a landscape designer. Next slide. Um, we don't, I wanted to show you that um, a lot of the projects I'll be showing are from you know, building in the open landscape, so these very raw projects we get to work on. Um, but we also, of course, work on small gardens as well. And so I just wanted to show you some of those before we jump into the bigger ones. Next slide. Um, I just read this, this quote, and I think this is really interesting. Uh, this is from a book that just came out called Wild by Biden um, Publishers. Real nature is difficult for many to read, sometimes too wild, sometimes too dull, definitely too untidy, and too difficult to make sense of. That's been a lot of my experience with clients, um, is they, a lot of them hire us to almost, I would say, connect them back with nature. So a lot of our projects, that's usually the brief. And it sort of becomes this collaboration about understanding the place, what grows there, topography, the climate patterns, et cetera, et cetera. So we go on this journey together in this collaboration to re reconnect with place more often than not. That's our goal. Next slide. And, and really, um, that reminded me that so much of what's come before us was about enclosure, safety, protection, surviving, growing your own things. So, so many of these examples from the past are about more or less closing off to nature because it's dangerous and it's coming to get you. And then we're, now we're going through this phase, at least in my career, where people are wanting to reach out and I'll show some of that as we go. Next slide. This was an interesting slide. This is um, Mission San Antonio and Again, you know, these little glimpses or windows into nature and, of course, these channels bringing water back to you, like that's the way to think of nature of what can we get from it and bring back, which we still are dealing with today. Next slide. And these, you know, there's these beautiful enclosed gardens that, again, we play a big part in our projects, even the ones that reach out into nature, um, will often have very enclosed, secure, protected spaces on those same landscapes. Next. Same thing, like we've, these historic gardens have been a real guide for us in our work. Next. And then showing how that's influenced some of our work. This is a garden up on Franklin Street in Spaghetti Hill in Monterey. Um, for a friend of mine, we ended up, I think we've done three or four gardens for this same person. Every time he, we finish one, he sells it and off he goes on to the next, which nearly kills me. I'm like, how can you sell this? But anyway, that's all new from paving to walls to the olive trees to fire, dining, etc. Next. And you can see the influence, you know, you can tell I've walked through a lot of the adobe gardens and it's more of my, in, you know, current day interpretation of how they go about it and we're mixing, there was some existing boxwood on the edge so we kept that and, but we're in filling with succulents and rosemary and olives and citrus and roses. Next slide. And you can see the diversity of plant material and then finding these old limestone vessels and using them as water features. Um, this beautiful focal point urn. Next slide. Yeah, he kills me. He just goes, I'm going to sell the house. Really? <laughs> we kill ourselves and then he moves, and I'm sure everybody here has been through that. Next. Um, this is out of the area. This is a 1929 Spanish revival in Atherton on Alana with these beautiful existing palm trees, but everything else you see is us, with including... Uh, the roses on the wall that climb around. So basically, again, I'm known for these, I think people think of me as the grass person or something in the wild, but I'm just as happy working in enclosed gardens. Our firm gets really, really excited about these projects. Next slide. And some of the details of that same garden, and again, you can see the influences. Next. There we are with the roses. I have a little romance in me. 
people who don't know me. <laughs> I like the smell of roses and crumbling rosemary while you're by the fire pit. Um, so yeah, like these, when you have architecture like this that has that authentic nature, I don't care what the style is, what the theme is, if it's authentic, all day, every day, I'm going with it landscape-wise. Next slide. This is a recent garden in Carmel that we did, a small courtyard garden. I've started to get more interested in video because the still slides just, you'll see why after I show some of the other videos, just to give the audience a feel for what it's like to be in there. This was taken about a month ago in the garden. Perfect, next slide. Can anybody tell that I went to up the Alhambra about three years ago? I've been on three trips to um, Andalusia and just so humbling. I thought I knew a thing or two about water features and then you see about 500 of them that are better than the one you did. Um, and then again, you know, there's this, this, you know, protection and courtyard and then these landscapes that we get to experience every day. Next. And also to me, talking about ecotypes, that hill is basically saying to me, I'm not exactly fond of plants growing on me. There's no soil left there basically, no water, it's inhospitable, and you know, some of the landscapes we work on are that, but you can see where all the soil has washed to, down by the Salinas River, so I look at those things and I think you can take that same model and apply it even in a small garden of where do the plants want to grow and where don't they want to be and where do I use my water, where, how carefully do I use my resources. Next slide. And then there's this, as I mentioned earlier, is this reaching out, which, is, which I really think is a newer thing and, you know, for years we've been, people have been doing these enclosed gardens, walling off, um, basically saying that's the edge and don't go out there, it stops there. And then there's this, um, we've, um, I've, I've had some good mentors who have helped show me about, you know, um, looking out, how do we connect authentically and essentially not make fools of ourselves because it's wild out there and it can be pretty embarrassing when, if you put a bad landscape move in a big broad landscape like the ones I showed earlier. Next slide. And this was one of the, one of the things, this project was basically the project that got me started on moving out into the landscape more. It's a project um, just inland from Point Reyes in Forest Knolls, and it was for a South African couple, and they, they um, I'm taking a photo from their house, essentially, um, and they said, I said, well, what's the most important thing to you in the landscape? Uh, and they said, well, swimming, we're both competition swimmers and we need a 75 foot lap pool. And I said, well, what about we put it out in the meadow where you're just like swimming as if you're in the swimming in the middle of the grass. And to my surprise, they never questioned it. They just said, sounds great, that was it. So end of story, never had to fight for it. So this project got published in the New York Times and I got lots of calls about doing other projects kind of out in the wild. So, but this was the one that started it all for me in California at least. I had these ideas in my head, I just didn't know anybody was gonna let me do it. Next slide. Um, and then that led to, as you saw in the earlier images, um, so we were getting calls on these projects which resembled where I was hiking, which I wasn't used to. You know, typically they were smaller projects. They weren't in the broad landscape. And this project came up in Cienega Valley and it's, um, it was a 600 acre ranch with a walnut orchard. And um, this was the first uh, site visit. And I think, I think that might be Michael Bliss who I saw earlier with me who worked on this project an absolutely fabulous project, great collaboration with um, Feldman Architecture. But you can imagine um, how overwhelmed we are, like standing in the middle of this field, sort of like, where's the house go? What are we doing? Where's the driveway, Etc. And from that, 
um, Michael and I started on some sketches. We'll go back one. We could. And <laughs> it was kind of funny because everything that was sketched, it was like, make it longer, make it bigger, make, make that arc broader. You know, like it was constantly like, it's not big enough, it's not big enough because it was just, we needed to really feel like we were part of this valley. And so the architect was great to collaborate because they ended up doing these sort of series of pods that all connected and you can see they spread across the property. And then we had the task of doing this really beautiful sweeping driveway which came around. So that gives you a sense of how we were scaling things because the plan looked a whole lot bigger than it actually did on site. So we had to keep obviously staking it out and making sure we honored the landscape and the hill behind, which is just so precious. <clears throat> and um, we did this great job with the driveway of like doing this huge sweep. And really where I went to in my head when this all happened was, I went back to my childhood and I said, I remember those ranches in Australia. What did they do? And I started looking back at the driveways and so forth. And usually just for practical reasons, they would you know, work with the contours and so forth and so on. And in this case, that's what we did, because as you can see, it actually it looks fairly flat in the images, but you can see there's quite a slope going up to the house. And we did this um, beautiful stone wall here that's all made out of local stone from Cienega Valley. And the architect, um, Feldman Architecture, did these beautiful rammed earth walls. And as I said, they did this sort of series of pods that you pass through. And then you can see the building, when you get down sort of at human level, you can see it's just sort of dancing its way across the site, you know, with this amazing hillside behind. Um, Stoker, Stoker and Alaire were the contractors, and um, I didn't realize this until I just looked at the slides, but that's Mario, who worked on my house in Carmel, who works with Stoker and Alaire, and he's there pouring the rammed earth walls, and, um, you know, I think it's 22 feet high is the tallest wall. There they are. So that was Mario at the top of that wall. So the things that the contract, luckily I was there on that day when he was pouring, because otherwise all I would have seen was like, well, that turned out well. It seemed like there was no work involved. And that gives you a feel from the inside with the rammed earth walls and the way Feldman architecture created these beautiful spaces between walls, second level. This is the um, passage that goes through the landscape, essentially. It feels like you're on a landscape walk, and you end out the other side, and there's a swimming pool off the end, the end of the house. Beautiful detail, and great work by Feldman and Stoker and Alea to get to this level of detail. You see some of the effects, those things that you don't expect until it happens. Unbelievable. Really breathtaking being inside. Um, and then, in a way, the opposite of that, you know, like the other, the other project in Cienega Valley, it was like, how do we nestle into the hill to feel like we're somewhere? And this one was, how do we dodge 3,000 trees to fit a house and a swimming pool here? So, um, radically different. This project is for the Kabrinskis in Markham Ranch, built by Groza Construction. Um, the house was first, and then we had a play field down here, and originally, in the original design, we had a swimming pool, and um, they said, oh, we'll do the pool later, and we were kind of like, yeah, 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 that's never going to happen. And years later, we came back in to work on the pool house with the architect design arc, from Los Angeles, and the swimming pool with access from down on the road here. So I think this happened, I'm guessing, at least six years after the house was built. So now it's complete. And you can see what it feels like. That's from the house looking out at the swimming pool. Amazing concrete work by Miller Brothers here. Just a pleasure to work with them with the pool house and then a jacuzzi out on the deck, just completely in the wild. And the views of that, that's from the house terrace right there. Um, another project in Carmel Valley by uh, this, this building's by Jim Jennings. 
Um, and then totally different palette. This is about as far inland where the Monterey Cypress end. So it has fog influence and then it starts to change. Um, but this very wild, you know, chaparral coming up the um, hill with this beautiful sculptural building by Jim Jennings and us bringing the wild in a little more. We're just starting on another project with Jim Jennings uh, the last few days. So I'm um, looking forward to another one. This one's right on a cliff on the coast. So it'll be exciting to see what we do. Um, another fairly new project uh, in Carmel Valley done by um, Turnbull Griffin Haslop, uh, recently finished. And some of these, it just got photographed in the last three weeks, I think, for the first time. So we're just starting to get some images of that. Um, and then on this one, uh, Jory Clark, local interior designer, did an amazing job on the interior inside. Um, that's, look, that's down the hill, looking back over the bocce court and playable area. The, the grassland that you see in all of these, including the next image, Basically, there was close to no native grasses left on the site, and the home site on this one is six acres. And so at, on the first site meeting, I said to the clients, before we go too far, I just have to pre-warn you that I think we're gonna spend $100,000 before you do anything eradicating poison oak and, and basically all these weeds that have come in through agriculture and do the grassland so you can just have this soft cushion that you walk out onto. And they said, sounds good. And they totally went for it. So this is a massive restoration project done by Habitat Gardens landscape firm who we've worked on a lot of projects with. And I think this one is a um, video. We'll see if it plays. This was taken by me as the photographer was there about, yeah, three weeks ago, I think. One of the joys of being with a photographer is they never go to the gardens. They go to the gardens at, I had to get up with her at 5.30. She was at the garden by 5.45. Then she skips the whole middle of the day and then she goes back at 6 p.m. and photographs till dark. And I never get to see the gardens like this because we're always there in the middle of the day meeting with the client about our checklist or planting or we're there with the contractors. So going back in the evening, as you know, that's just the time to be there, no question at all. Um, we do, this is what we call a dirty sheet. Um, at the beginning of each project, we do a lot of notes about observations at some of the first meetings. And we, our goal always is to sort of take this complexity and basically just clarify it and turn it into something that appears to be very simple as if there was no complexity or we never had to think about anything. Because we definitely don't want the clients thinking about all these things when they're sitting in the landscape overwhelmed. So it's always about, all right, how do we just take all of those considerations, apply them to the design, essentially. So for this project, um, we, this is the, the, that diagram was for this project, which is for Daniel Pahoda, uh, architect from San Francisco. Um, the project is called Arroyo Sequoia, and basically we had this woodland that you drove through to get to the house, and then behind, the grade mellowed out. So the reason for the two-story element was so that you could park underneath the house. That's the garage doors right there. And then the way you get into the project is you go up these um, stairs here that go through the trees and up through the building, essentially, and you end up in a courtyard at the back that I'll show photographs of. That's the master bedroom, main living space, and there's a beautiful bridging element there that you feel like you're in a tree house. And Ben Langford, who's here, worked on this one. This is one of, one of his first major projects, although there's a couple more, but um, 
yeah, amazing to think this young guy from Texas is uh, getting to work on these projects and just doing amazingly well. And that's, the, that's what I was talking about with the bridging element to the master bedroom over here. Oh, actually, sorry, it's to the left of this. Um, and that's the stairs that you come up when you first arrive at the landscape. So you go from the lower woodland parking and then you arrive at this. So you're basically walking into a landscape painting and the door is around and to your right. So it's kind of like a back door in a way, which nobody ever complains about because they just walk up and go, oh, and then they have to sort of figure out where the door is. This is again, so once you can see what I mean about it, it was great to put the parking below because at one point they were going to put the parking up on top here and we said, well, there'll be no landscape left. You won't have anywhere to be. So then they quickly um, parked under the building and then you just arrive up to this serenity above the parking garage. We're lucky to work with a... There we go. Um, that's the end of the building. Uh, as you can see, where you just feel like you completely can leave it in nature. Daniel's a really wonderful architect. And we have these pathways that carry on up, onto the site, up to the upper site. And that leads up to this spot here. So you can see I was in this spot looking this way, parking below. And then this uh, stairway brings you up to the fire pit where you have a completely different view. And you get also a little more of the westerly view looking across the house there, as you can see in the afternoon. So beautiful sunsets. Um, this is, we're very lucky to get in. I mean, the key to all of this, including the projects with Marianne, which I'll show in a minute, we pretty much demand that we get in at this stage with the architect, or else if we're late to the show, and they've kind of done their thing, and we're coming in to add on to it, we really, um, I just don't think we can do our work well. It's not to say we've never worked that way, but it's not obviously the most ideal way to work. And I've all, uh, people who know me always say that when we do it that way, if, we're, if it's the architect one, us one, one plus one equals three, it's the only way to get to three with one plus one. You can exceed the sum. This is with the client. We're with the architect and the client sitting here having a design meeting. This is this magnificent valley oak here. And you can see um, we're walking through these long grasses every time we went to a meeting. And they, we had a number of these meetings and like walk through the rooms, how the house would work. And that's the same oak. So the architect very carefully built around bedroom wing, living wing, how you enter, the entry is over here. So you walk, the parking is over behind this wall and you basically turn around, walk between these two walls here and walk on a platform that goes here. But your first view on center is this valley oak, just total um, appreciation of this special thing. Um, and then we've gone to great lengths to keep it in good health. Um, this house, when you're inside, it's like you're outside, essentially. And that's the one thing I notice with a lot of the architects we work with. We don't need to do a ton of outdoor dining areas or accessory areas. Um, we do some, of course, but like on this one, we're just sitting essentially under the valley oak in gravel, and that's the dining room. So the wall, the glass walls go back, fold back into the building. So essentially it's just like an outdoor dining pavilion, even though it's an interior space. That's the opposite side of the house. Um, swimming pool running parallel with the house and this beautiful built-in fire pit um, and um, you know, almost like you're walking straight from an interior space to something that appears to be another interior space as far as comfort goes. There's a built-in barbecue behind this scene and then a deck to the left at the end of the pool. This one was also built by uh, Grozer Construction as well. Ah, forgot about this one. 
this is interesting, we don't always arrive at these bucolic landscape spaces and think, how do we not screw this up? Although I do think that most of the time. This is what we arrived to on this particular project. Somebody had come up with a great idea of totally excavating this site and putting wattles everywhere to stop erosion. I have no idea what their plan was, but our, plan, our directive was fix that. <laughs> and so we worked with an architect, Ken Lindstead, and also Stoker Construction on this project. And it was a bit of a nightmare because we had to like reimagine the land as it would have been and assist Ken in what elevation do we set buildings at so that we can naturally grade to them and from them. And he was just wonderful to collaborate. So it was sort of a grading and restoration project. But that was my first site visit. That's what it looked like, nightmare. So if you watch for that tree, so you can see it there in the background. So you can see how we had to reimagine all the way through, and then Ken just threaded the needle wherever we had him um, set the buildings, essentially. So it's a series of different levels, including a lower level, with a, a green roof over a bunkhouse there, bedrooms underneath, master bedroom on the end, swimming pool out here, garage into the hillside and entry through here. Uh, that's the auto court that you arrive into and some of the views, I love going downstairs, that's one of the views from the bunkhouse you can see with this slot window into the wild. That's from the front door, looking back up the hill. So that's why the grading was so essential, because if we didn't get that right, we would have had this enormous wall coming down, you know, so you wouldn't have had a view of nature. So we worked really closely with Ken to make sure we could have a low wall with a water feature here. As you got inside the house, you turn around and look back and get a surprise, because all the focus is this way coming in. Swimming pool, speaking about sort of building out into nature, you know, this is a common theme for us of, you know, reflecting nature in swimming pools, letting them go out into the wild, not looking like a hotel with 50 lounges around them and that type of thing. And then what it looks from the inside looking out you can just see it's absolutely breathtaking in some of these projects. This is another one by Feldman Architecture. Um, one that we did a lot of sustainability moves on as well that I'll show you in a minute. But basically, as you can see, the whole building just sort of opens up to all sides of the landscape. So the strategy from Feldman was to capture all the, the rainwater off the top of these roofs here and that Ben Langford I think this, Ben, was this your first real big project? Where are you? Was it? Yeah. So, yeah, Ben and I had a lot of fun on this one. All the water gets captured, um, and then it goes into these tanks here. And then the drainage strategies are really interesting too, because we have this low area behind that you'll see in some of the images, and all the drainage comes out below this levitating bridge here. So a lot of the grassland is watered by these drainage strategies. It still dries out. Uh, we don't get enough rain, um, but we, we, we basically get it to live. Then it goes summer dormant and then comes back again. You'll see, a, I'm going to show a video in a minute, and it's generally of that area there. Uh, you can play this video. This is a video to sort of show you what it's like outside and moving through the, ho through the house. It looks like a real estate ad. We have a clever photographer on these projects. but that's at the dining table. 
Yeah, Jory Clark. And that's back out through the side door of the dining area. So you kind of get the feel for it. You're basically in the landscape when you're in these houses. It feels like there's no separation. And then I'm adding one more slide, the next one, to show you what it's like most days out there. That to me is really exciting. This is a video I took. This is the experience I have in the landscapes when we don't have a photographer who doesn't like wind or sun in the camera. <laughs> this is reality. Sometimes clients will ask for sculpture and we're kind of like, well, I'm not sure you need it. And then this last one is a, I think it was a five gallon manzanita we planted nearly 10 years ago. Very proud of that one. It was about that big when it went in. That's the idea for the roofs. That was the original sketch by Jonathan Feldman about the capturing water. Next slide. And then seeing from the other side exactly how accurate it was to the original sketches. It was just amazing. He had this clear vision. We went with it. And it's all, even though it's all about connecting with nature, it's also capturing all the water from there. And they go into these tanks over here, which are covered in grapes. And then the drainage system goes under this area here and disperses out into the meadow here. Um, on the sustainability, this was one of the more, um, this was a real learning process for us. We worked with, you can see, William McDonough and partners on a project years ago. And um, it ended up having so many, it had an, the most water harvesting we've done on a project gray water systems, uh, very large edible garden, goats, chickens. They, ho ha they um, make their own olive oil on the project as well. Um, I'm probably skipping a few things there, but uh, rammed earth walls again. So, you know, we learned a lot about, you know, how these s apparently sustainable methods work, some of them better than others. Um, so this was almost like a launching pad to a lot of the grey water systems and the rainwater harvesting that we've done since. Um, it's a very beautiful project. Um, the client there just, to this day, we still um, work on maintaining, adding, subtracting from the landscape. David Leroy from, from the office goes out to the project, constantly updates with the client, Patty but it was really her baby. She wanted this place um, to just be and do every, touch the earth, essentially. And at first, I thought, oh, here we go. You know, another one of those who has looked at an article in a magazine about how you can do all these things in your own landscape, but, you know, we won't really do all of them, but she did more than she said and continues to to this day. And then that's the original sketches we did with William McDonough Rainwater harvesting tanks down here that are covered in roses and a cut, cut flower garden. That's the swimming pool you saw. This is a bocce court I'll show you in a minute. Um, there's also the harvesting of, or the storage of water under the driveway. Edible gar gardens and greenhouse, goats and chickens back here. And we collected a lot of the original native grasses from the site and propagated them and Habitat Gardens did this one as well, so they divided a lot of the grasses and grew more of them, and we ended up using a lot of them in the landscape as well. And at a pretty big cost to do all of this, so the client really put the money where their mouth is and went for it all the way. Uh, that's the landscape. That's looking through the barn. That's a working barn where she has all of her tools, does seed collection, propagates, and then that's through to the edible garden on the other side. Next slide. Her again, walking in the landscape with a lot of the restored grasses with her dogs. Next slide. The bocce court is deeply embedded into the production olive orchard. She, um, it was another one where she said she was gonna do this and start making her own olive oil. 
and I couldn't believe how many tastings she went to, so we really carefully selected all of the varieties. I think there's between four and six varieties from memory, and each year I get her olive oil, and it's the best olive oil I've ever tasted. Next slide. Uh, down, uh, getting back to the coast, this is a project we did down near the river mouth. Um, it's between Carmelo and Scenic. And um, we reclaimed, all of these stakes were on site, so we reclaimed them and used them as a retaining method, like wattles, because <laughs> I had the great idea of removing all of the ice plant. There was like no native grasses on the site, it was just sand dunes. And any of you who know this area, if you look at the opposite side of Scenic over in this direction, it's just crumbling off the road. And I don't know if you guys remember the year the river went up against and under Scenic and they had to close the road. This, this looked like this and it was just like, why don't they use those plants over there and get rid of that ice plant? But it's obviously it's a big undertaking. So they trusted us to do that. We planted everything. The sand not, never stopped shifting. It was terrifying watching it, but then it all filled in. Uh, and it's, I think the whole front is native plants here, and then it transitions to a combination of natives and other Mediterranean climate coastal plants. And it's the original artist's cottage. Some of the people in the audience probably know more about it than I do, but the owners, the current owners, have been so sensitive to this house, because you can imagine what they could have done. They've essentially kept the house the way it was. It's so so graceful and beautiful the way they've handled this property and continue to. Next slide. That's what happens when you get up onto the property. So that's just outside the cottage with the view of the lagoon and the river mouth looking south towards Monastery Beach right there. So it's hard to go back one slide. It's just so hard to believe. Like when you're looking from there or you come up the driveway, you have no idea that that's going to be your view. So it's a very big wow. Next. And you can see even the way they handled that, if you go back to that slide, um, it's just very modest. We did the wall and the paving, but it's all with just Carmel stone, you know, a metal fire pit. It's very humble. You know, they, they don't want anything fancy. Next slide. Uh, this project was with Marianne, and um, Marianne was in process on this project. In fact, I should have showed the before shots of when we arrived, because it was a bit of a mess, as Marianne knows, at this stage, when we first turned up. Um, and Ben and I had, Ben Langford and I, had this whole discussion. This was, I think, was an early sketch by Ben from a site meeting of how are we going to approach this hillside as you get down into the landscape and... Um, look back at the house. Next slide. And that's the exact after shot. So good sketch, Ben. That was a good idea. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we, you know, she had this house with these retaining, curving concrete retaining walls with this incredible backdrop, and then it just drops down at this point, and there's some solar panels below. Um, and this client, we most we used a lot of native plants, but they also wanted to sort of insert these other, again, Mediterranean climate um, plant varieties. And I think they really improved the project a lot. We fought it a lot. We were like, no, 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 we don't want to use too many things. But it turned out we learned a lot by listening to this client, and we've since used a lot of these methods on other projects. A great client who's since moved to Nova Scotia sold the house. looking from the house um, in an easterly direction, sunrise. Um, below, that's coming off the driveway below with all these wonderful natives, coffee berries, ceanothus, manzanitas, uh, different grasses, cesslarias, carexes. So really, really beautiful rolling hillside. And then Marianne did a wonderful job with this lower, what turned out to be an office space. <laughs> I think it was planned as something else, Marianne can tell us later, this area down below. But the minute it was built, the client said, that's my office. Because <laughs> it was so beautiful once you got down there and you can see the green roof rolls over the top of it and you have this direct connection 
off into the lower landscape from those rooms with a beautiful water feature over here. Another coastal project. This one is um, point five, uh, half a mile north of Esalen. Um, and it was a Kaikuyu covered hillside. I don't remember any other plants. So this was all planted by us essentially all the way out to the bluff. So it's a, it was a wonderful opportunity to sort of reconnect instead of having this Kaikuyu lawn essentially rolling down the hill, um, reconnect back with the bluff edge here. And you'll see in a minute, there's some beautiful um, views north as well. And this is that same stone we used on the Cienega Valley project. Uh, so a fairly local stone um, and beautifully done walls by Habitat Gardens again. Next slide. And then that's the view north as you get down to the lower area. So you see you get this complete connection. And um, I think this speaks to what I said earlier where you can really screw up on these landscapes as in when that's the background, you're like, all right, let's think about this. So we always approach them with humility and think, you know, like what would be the best thing for this landscape or this ecotype? And also how do we stay within the scale and the feel of the backdrop? Scale being the main thing, you know, more often than not the mistake I think I see made is where things just look out of scale with the background. So we're always trying to like make them human spaces make feel like they hug you, not too big, not too small. So we spend a lot of time on that scaling things. And then if we could play this video, this is a video that Michelle Magdalena, local um, artist, made for us a number of years ago. And I think it sums everything up. You just watch the volume, because there's some speed. I am Bernard Trainer. I am the founder of a landscape architecture studio based in Northern California. An aspect of landscape design that really excites us as a studio is when people disconnect from the architecture and the civilized spaces and they forge opportunities to experience something more wild. This interaction with nature creates a sensory experience that can be sanctuary and refuge, especially in more urban areas. On the other side of this, however, on the rural projects, nature envelops you almost in an overwhelming way and our task here or our goal here is to create a sense of comfort for people. The design philosophy of the studio is to create contextual landscapes. We feel the best way to do this is to understand the personality of the client, the identity of the architecture, and the uniqueness of the site. I don't know of anybody who has gone into a beautiful landscape who hasn't come out with an emotional recharge. And I've had many um, past clients say to me in almost an embarrassed way, they don't know why they feel so good in their landscapes. And I say, well, that's what I wanted. I didn't necessarily want you to be able to quantify why you feel good in our landscapes, because I think it should be all the things that generally go unnoticed by humans. It's more of a sensory experience. At the end, I really feel like I want our work to not be visual, but more of a feeling. And I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you. I did want to say one thing I was going to mention at the start. I wanted to dedicate this talk to uh, Jerry Lomax, who um, believed in me before anyone else did here. He just immediately took to me and just helped me believe in myself to go on and do some of this work. And he was really my segue into the local AIA and he was such an advocate for good design. So yeah, I think about him a lot. So I just wanted to dedicate this to him, amazing man, and thank him for everything he did for me. Thanks.
Uh, just the abbreviation AIA. Um, American Institute of Architects, and okay. this is like the local branch, the Monterey branch of the American Institute of Architects. Did I have that right, Eric? You got it. Cool. Woo. And then there's also ASLA, which is the landscape architects version of that as well. Any other questions? Uh, the project in Seneca Valley, uh, has that been in any um, publications? That's a good question. It is in, we have two monographs out, um, one that was done in 2013 and one that was done in 2019. And it's in, Ben, is it in the second one? First, the first one, maybe. First one, yeah, which is called Land Prints. Mm -hmm. And the second one is called Ground Studio, and you can find them on Amazon. So that is in there. Okay, thank you. I haven't been there for years. I have no idea how it looks anymore, but hopefully good. Hi, Bernard. Um, hey, Libby. Libby here. <laughs> I, I guess I'm wearing my coat hat committee on the environment. Um, Another acronym. Uh, Bernard, how are you, um, how's your practice um, and your plantings and design um, adapting to climate change? So here we've got um, very dry weather, you know, we're seeing the increase, uh, you know, sustained droughts and also wildfires. How do you approach those issues? Yeah, I was wondering when someone would bring up the wildfires because as you know, that's become radically different recently in relative terms. And um, so what we've been doing about, you know, bringing nature up to you is like all getting reinvented, partly because of the, um, as you know, the regulatory process too. So we're still figuring that part out. We've always had to conform with, well, not always, more recently in particular, fuel modification zones, dead wooding of trees, you know, to stop laddering and so forth. So we continue to work on that. But as far as what you see in some of the regulations, yeah, I just heard somebody sigh then. I don't know how we're going to pull that and give people beautiful gardens. We're still working through that. Santa Lucia Preserve, we're doing a lot of work with, with the fuel modification zone. So we're practicing a lot there and trying to apply that to other projects. And on the water use, um, we, we've decided that, I don't even know if I want to use the word sustainability, but regenerative landscapes. Um, we've decided that's going to become our main focus for the coming years. I think we've already been doing that in a lot of ways, but we feel like we need to go, go up not, a lot of notches. So we're trying to decide currently over the next year what our goals are going to be. Um, and one of them, to use an example, so we're trying to you know, pick the low-hanging fruit as it comes. I'm about to embark on a no-irrigation project, no automated irrigation, hand-watered in the beginning and then left to its own devices. And I've been practicing that for the last 10 years on my own garden as a laboratory. So I'm going to apply some of those rules. Um, and that's a different thing depending, like if you're on the coast and it's foggy, it's one thing. You're in land, where does that go, kind of thing. So it's different for every situation, but the water use, I think, will become an enormous... And also, we're noticing the rainfall patterns changing. And from what I hear, it's generally going to be much more high-level discharge in tighter time periods, which is really going to be hard because, you know, we're going to have drainage issues as well with that, and all the water, where do we put the water, and then we're going to have longer periods between rain. So um, we are trying to think about forward-thinking ways of not only for us, but hopefully influencing others with that. Well, and in collaborating with the architect at the beginning, because we can bring forward those you know, water-saving techniques, whether it's free water or catchment or other ways to naturally yeah, absolutely. And we have done that on a number of projects. The gray, I'm a big fan of the grey water systems. I think they're underutilized. But again, the regulatory process is really tough. We did the first grey water system in Mountain View 
probably 10 years ago, it's just a struggle to get them to allow a grey water system. Whereas in Australia, you know, they're doing black water systems on residential projects. So you are, you, the client's paying for that too. So it's a bit of a dance and you've got to have the, like that one client I talked about with Willie McDonough. They just overpaid for everything. None of it was ever going to pay them back. They purely did it for the planet. We don't have uh, wood swallows gathering sticks to, uh, to guide us to what the winter is going to bring, but like they do in Australia. But um, do you, I know it's been a while, but do you correspond with your colleagues in Australia on the same topics t that you've just discussed? Uh, yeah. Wildfires and, and dreaded droughts and deep droughts. Definitely. Um, they have, in Australia, they have what I think is the best uh, symposium in the world every two years that they're called the Australian Landscape Conference. And they have nearly a thousand people attend, and it's expensive. And so there's just a big following of how, we, how to do things differently, and I've spoken at that twice. And so at those times, I've learned a lot, and I almost come back a little embarrassed because I feel like I don't necessarily think they're further ahead on design and aesthetics than here, obviously, but on other things. Yeah, you come back and you're like, what are we thinking? We're just using too many resources. So I do, yeah, I do correspond with certain people. Um, and yeah, they watch what I'm doing, I watch what they're doing. They're all trying, we're all trying to work together to do something a little better. And it just, as you know, it takes time. And it takes the right clients to support us to do this, because obviously it's not inexpensive. And sustainability is incredibly expensive at the moment, yeah. And we can't, like, the, just the tanks are so expensive and the rain, they don't get a re summer recharge, so you're just like trying to store from March, April through to November. So you empty them out often by May, June, you know, unless we start rethinking how we're planting, which we're trying to do. Thank you, Bernard. Would you tell us briefly what your garden looks like and how it makes you feel? Uh, nobody has asked me that ever. And um, it makes me feel about the same as what I said about Jerry Lomax when I got emotional. Um, it's changed my life. I've, I've been in this garden for the last 11 years and I didn't know I could love a garden this much. It's a special property. I don't know if any of you ever remember Hanley, the timber merchant in Carmel. Um, there's Hanley Road that's right near Carpenter, and he used to own all the property up there. So I'm in the, a house that's 1946 that was built by Hanley, the timber merchant from Carmel. And um, there's just a spirit of place that I haven't experienced. And so everything I do there, I just feel like I'm adding on to that legacy. Um, and my, my garden is published in a few books. The one I mentioned earlier that's called Wild. And... It's in another book, I think it's called Gardens of the West, um, that was published a few years ago. So you can see photographs of it, but it, the feeling is overwhelming. The things this garden has done for me, I didn't know were possible in a garden. So yeah, I've never had that. I've of course loved designing gardens for clients and watching them love them. Like there's the love of watching them love them, but the actual coming back to me, nothing like it. I didn't know it was possible. So, yeah, thanks for asking that question. Yeah, it's a love affair with my garden. I'm out there all the time. So, I don't see any more questions. That was a perfect closure. Thank you for this inspirational closure of our lecture series. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank you, and thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you.